Hello, welcome to Abiding Life Studios. I'm Noah Wells. Today I have with me Steve Reinhard. Hi, Noah. Hey, how are you? And Hi. we also have Steve Hahn with us. Hi, Noah. Hi, Steve. Hey, Steve and Noah. So uh, Steve and I have known each other since uh, 1979. Can you believe that? Uh, we were, uh, we met, uh, I actually knew uh, Steve's sister before I knew him, him Carol. And uh, when, before she was married and we, before we had any kids. And so Steve and I went to a training program out in California where we, uh, if, if we were already leaning toward being a legalist, it really helped pour the cement and concrete around our legalistic feet. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. right. And, and we became 110% performance-based in all of our Christian walk and acceptance. And, and because of that, um, I think we've grown uh, incredible amounts because we know how much that doesn't work. And so for, for, I think if you were to try and drag Steve or me back into a relationship with Christ where we had to do something, where we had to perform to be loved, mm -hmm. uh, you, would, uh, you would be like, it would be a bad, be like trying to drag a bear out of its den. It's like <laughs> not going to happen. And so Steve, it's really been great to connect with Steve a little bit over the last years in our inviting conversations. And uh, so he, he mentioned this wonderful idea. And I think it was kind of spawned from one of Mike's talks about, uh, you know, he had, your dad was really good at setting up the crowd to uh, say what we really think and feel and it was something like mm -hmm. this you, you, Steve why don't you go ahead and take over and say what that was and then uh, you know tell us what you want to share with us today right it it uh, it was exactly something Mike said but Mike didn't explain it but what he did do is he said you know he was uh, speaking once to about a group of 300 people and he asked the crowd he said let me ask you a question what do we need to do for God? And, you know, the, the hands shot up like rockets. You know, well, we need to evangelize. We need to study our Bibles. We need to pray. We need to give to the Lord and on and on and on. And he had to stop the people because there were so many things about what we needed or what we should be doing for God. And then he paused and he said, okay, let me ask you another question. What is God doing for you? Mm. and in that group of 300 people there was silence wow and so you know i started thinking about that and it was like well what is god doing for me and uh, because this wasn't the main focus of his talk but it yeah. but it it was something that really stuck in my mind it, well, what is god doing for me and so I think that's it's really important to know what God is doing for us. And I think one of the things that we need to really understand, and the first thing I wanted to say was that in any of these things, you know, we could give you a list of what God is doing for me or what Jesus is doing for me. But really, the key to all of this is what your concept of God is, because mm. if your concept of God is, is that it's a God that, you know, he's some kind of megalomaniac God who is some tyrant that's just out there waiting to, to beat you up when you step out of line, uh, then it's going to affect how you perceive the things that we're going to say. And I can understand how many people feel that because of the way that many pastors preach and, you know, that Jesus, Jesus saves you and now you need to do all these things to make him happy. Mm. And so that uh, if your concept of God is wrong, then you're going to have a difficult time with these concepts. And I think that's one of the great things about Abiding Life Ministries that's really helped me is to get me to think about a proper concept of God. And, you know, there's, well, it's something that I've struggled with and something that I think I really needed to deal with. And that's one of the most important things I think that I've gotten out of abiding life is, is my concept of God. And so 
it took years though for me to finally start to believe in my heart what god was truly like and there's nothing wrong with th taking years to grasp something that the lord's showing you i think and so it's not like you flip a light switch and all of a sudden i have this proper concept of god uh you know he's not surprised where i'm at and he knows exactly what i need and when i need it and exactly how long it's going to take me and is totally patient with me uh, throughout my entire life because we never fully arrive until we're going to be with him and become as he is but it's an exciting process if we focus on our relationship with jesus and as we all occasionally do when we lose our focus with him it's hard to see what he wants to reveal to us so but we just need to hang in there and be assured that he loves us and that he wants a relationship with us and that he's a good god he's 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 not a brutal god which which leads to the first point for me and that's there's no double standard with god and so first you know what does that mean there's no double standard with god well god doesn't reveal to his children what he doesn't do himself and the the way that i can explain that is you know i have a number of grandchildren and uh, there was one of our four-year-old granddaughters over here just just a sweetheart and the other day you know she was over here and you know our parents are working like good parents to get her to say please and thank you and things like that just a great goal and so when i hear her want something or ask for something you know i try to remind her to say please great she says please and so uh however later throughout the day when i'm asking her to do something for me she looks at me and says grandpa you're supposed to say please well, well, now who's being schooled? Yeah. Me. And the point of that is that with God, there is no double standard. Mm. He always says, please. And I think that we're all familiar with so-called leaders, you know, whether in business or in the church or in politics, who love to make rules for you, but don't follow them themselves. You know, they're the ones that are exempt. Rules are for everybody but them. And you know, Jesus pronounced one of his woes to the scribes for laying burdens on people that they were not willing to carry themselves. And so, but that's not our God, because the rules that God makes aren't so much for us to follow, although they're beautiful and there's life in them. They're not so much to follow as they are to reveal who God is and who we are. And that's why the law is a tutor. You know, God can't do anything, but follow them because it's who he is and we struggle because of who we are in the flesh okay so that's great so everything he wants me to do he does perfectly and completely every time and some of us will see that as intimidating and be like peter when he said depart from me lord for i'm a sinful man you know but we really should do just the opposite he says what we really should say is that i need you lord for i'm a sinful man mm -hmm. i need you because i'm sinful does God want me to live the Sermon on the Mount? Great. Does he live the Sermon on the Mount? Of course he does. Think of this. He wants me to love my enemies. Does God love his enemies? Hmm. Are you his enemy? Does he love me, his child? Of course he does. If he loves his enemy, he certainly loves his child. But for some reason, we love to go to that place that says he doesn't love me. Mm. So one of the most important things to know is that there is no double standard with God. And this makes me want to come to him, not run away. So that's just kind of one of the first things. You guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, yeah. thanks for sharing that, that there's no double standard with God. And that he doesn't reveal anything about himself um, and that he doesn't actually do. So he's not making rules for us uh, right. that he's not actually, you know, living and, and caring. So, you know, I've never had any problems with that. Probably Noah does though. <laughs> no, I <don't. laughs> yeah. I read about that once. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, Noah, have you ever caught yourself, uh, 
uh, my first uh, my first recollection of that was with my mom. Uh, she when I was like three or four, she was tickling me, tickling me, tickling me, and I said I I just shouted out at her. I was like, God damn it, stop! And, <laughs> and she said, No, you go cousin. Like where did you learn that? And I just said from you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so it's like, yeah, there that there, there is no double standard. Is refreshing to to hear because that's so hard to be in a relationship uh, with someone where they've got expectations for you, but they're not willing to really follow those themselves. I've, mm. I've, I've you know, I really struggle in lots of relationships where, cause we do that with each other, at least I do, mm -hmm. Barb and I do, we have double standards for each other. So we expect different things from her. And I think we bring that into our walk with the Lord. I definitely have done that. So that's really refreshing to hear. And, well, and motivating me, too, motivating. Mm -hmm. for, for me, you know, I've been to churches where, you know, the pastor just constantly beats up the congregation and, mm -hmm. well, you know, you need to do this and you need to do that. And we need to be evangelizing and say, and, and it's not that those things aren't true, but it's the motive behind it. And a lot of times I want to walk up afterwards and say, well, you better get busy. You know, why haven't you, why haven't you done this stuff? Where, when are you doing these things? Yeah. And let's go do them. You know, you and I, let's go out and uh, just see what happens. It'd be interesting. Yeah. I've been, go ahead, Noah. I was just going to say, yeah, I agree on when I've gone to church before getting beat up on things I need to do, like evangelism. I've even heard a pastor say it's a sin not to do it. So then you leave there going, what's wrong with me? I need to go out there and do more. I need to do this. I need to do that. And it just, it traps you on yeah, all the true. duties. That's yeah. Another thing that's not, it's not quite a double standard, but it's, um, you know, like we could look at the sermon on the mountain. We could say, oh my gosh, that's easy for God to say. Mm. It's easy for an evangelist who's got a gift of evangelism to say, yeah, you should be evangelizing or you're sinning. Yeah. But for him to be mm, empathetic maybe or mm, go wash the dishes and not be up in front of anybody might not be so easy um, for him yeah uh, so I think sometimes we the double standard is we we expect other people to do the things that are easy for us and those are really easy mm. to put a burden on someone All and right. it's so nice to know that God doesn't do that to us yeah. That he came and he lived as a man and he knows what it's like to have enemies. He knows what it's like to love enemies. He knows mm -hmm. what it's like to love us when we turn our backs on him. And uh, he's not calling us to, uh, to do or be anything that we're really not. Uh, so it's, it's refreshing to hear that. Mm -hmm. Well, that directly relates what you just said, Steve, to the next point is that he sympathizes with our weaknesses, mm. you know, and, and what does that mean? Well, wh where we get that from is in Hebrews two and Hebrews four, uh, towards the end of the chapter for both one. So Hebrews two says he had to be made like his brethren. Now think of that. He had to be made like his brethren in all things that brethren, that's us. Mm. So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people for since he himself was tempted in that which he was tempted he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted now we'll talk a little bit more about that but first Hebrews 4 says for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses so that means he can sympathize with our weaknesses but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay, that's great. Well, what does that mean? And so think of this. It's one of the reasons that Jesus had to become a man. And I'm, I'm sure there's more than one, but but he became a man so he could experience exactly what we go through. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing to be a God and look at your creation, 
but not really understand what it's like. And man can say, you don't know what it's like to be man. Mm -hmm. But man cannot say that because Jesus yeah. had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. He knows what it's like. And so we look to Jesus and, and just think of this, you know, and, you know, we think of sin and all that other kind of stuff. He never sinned. So he doesn't know what that's like. But but think of this. He, he knows what it's like to have some knucklehead walk into his carpentry shop and tell him how to do his job. Mm -hmm. He knows what that's like. He knows what it's like to have religious leaders tell him what he needs to know about God and how to live his life, even though the leaders had no clue themselves. Mm. He knows what that's like. Yeah. He knows what it's like to wake up in the morning and have every bone in his body telling him he doesn't want to get up. He just doesn't want to. He wants to go back to bed. He knows what that's like in his human form. He knows what it's like to see the sorrow of the world and evil men taking advantage of others and leaders who are out for nobody but themselves. He knows what that's like. And he knows how hard it is, for example, to be in a family that has no father. He knows what that's like. He knows what it's like to be in every situation and every circumstance that we have been in and yet without sin. It's just a beautiful picture because he knows exactly what it's like. And make no mistake, just because he didn't sin in these things, and thank God that he didn't, it doesn't mean that he doesn't know what it's like. He does. And that's why he can become our high priest. And that's why we can come to him with confidence and receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. It's something he's doing for us. It's why he's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. So how does he come to my aid? Well, what does that mean? Well, really, it's, it's when I focus on him. Mm -hmm. And you know, when Paul says to the Corinthians, no temptation is overtaking you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with all temptation, will provide a way of escape also, so that you're able to endure it. Well, you know, when I was a young Christian, I used to think like, well, where's this way of escape? You know, and I'd be looking for some physical thing to happen. And, uh, and you know, God can do that. And I'm sure it does do that in, in certain people's lives and in certain circumstances to help them. I don't, I don't want to discount that at all. But really the way of escape is Jesus and my relationship with him. That's my way of escape. Mm -hmm. And the problem is most of us don't want to hear that. You know, isn't there a book I can read? Isn't there a 10 part web series on how to avoid temptation that I can take? You know, anything would have to focus on my relationship with Jesus, but he knows what it's like to be human. And he understands, and he even understands that, that I want to do anything but focus on him. Mm. He's seen it all and he's experienced it all. And he knows what it's like. And the bottom line is that Jesus is for me. He's for me. It's part of his mission. He sympathizes with me. And maybe empathize is a better word because sympathize, I'm not sure the word empathize existed back when the scriptures were written, but it means he knows exactly what it's like. He knows how I feel. And he's been there. And so think of that. There isn't going to be anything that he doesn't understand and he's not going to reject me because of it mm. if I'm his child. He's my high priest before God because he's experienced humanity and the enemy is going to do everything he can to make me think otherwise. So don't go there. So well, can I interrupt a minute? You, yeah, you yeah. That's, now's the perfect time. Oh, that was so beautiful <clears throat> that he sympathizes with our weaknesses. Oh, man, I guess... You know, I, I, in a sense, I struggle with it because it's so, sometimes I tell myself that he doesn't really get it, mm. you know, that he really doesn't get me, he doesn't get the, the, the problems, is, you know, that I face. Um, uh, but you said he's not going to, he's not going to reject us. And so that was like my, so, so is there, so I just like throw that out is like, so there's nothing I could do uh, to get him to reject me. Is that on my own? If you're a child of God, yeah. I'm following you? Yeah, that, I believe that's true. If I'm a believer in him, then 
I'm his child. And, you know, as we've said before, uh, you know, if the children are out playing in the yard and my children are being bad and the neighbor's children are being great and, you know, the time for supper comes, I go out and I, who do I call in? Well, I call in my kids, not the neighbor kids, no matter how good the neighbor kids are. My kids are my kids. And now I may have to deal with them and, and discipline them, but that doesn't mean I reject them and say they're not my children anymore. So, no. yeah, that's so cool. It is. It's a I beautiful was, picture. I, I had, a, had an experience of that yesterday. I, uh, this is a little bit off track, but not too much. I was at a funeral, or not a funeral, but a, a, one of my really good friends who I really loved uh, died five years ago. And they, his wife and kids, daughter, daughter his stepdaughters uh, and sisters had a memorial service for him last night. It's, it's oh, by the way, it's Memorial Day weekend here, 2021. And so it was, I have also happened to be his birthday. So we went out and, we, and they made a big deal, lit candles and, uh, and uh, our friend, uh, she, her daughters are, um, Oh my gosh, they, they've had, they've gone through all sorts of trouble with drug dealing and drug using and prostitution and raising their granddaughters and uh, uh, in all sorts of ways. But it was so cool because last night that whole family was gathered together uh, to remember their dad, their grandpa. And, and they all came together, like you were saying, Steve, as a family. And because we're considered family, we got invited. Uh, and we're all we're all sitting there and just hugging each other and uh it was such a magical time because uh, we're, nobody was there because they were like the really great people uh, we were we were all there because we had a relationship uh, a bond you know and, and a really kind of an eternal a spiritual bond we all still have lots of struggles uh and, and that time was just so sweet and not because anyone was such a great, sweet person, um, but because, like you were saying, because of the relationship we have. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Exactly. And it is based on relationship. And mm -hmm. so if I have that relationship, then I'm a child. Now, this, you know, you know people that uh, really don't care to know Jesus or really want to establish that relationship. You know, I can't speak for them. I, I don't know. That's up to God. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I know that those who really seek him and want him, uh, he's not going to reject. It's up to him. Yeah. I mean, I can relate to the, I've had pain in my life where, you know, you're just laying there in excruciating pain and it is, it is interesting because that has popped in my head before that God knows, or Jesus knows pain. And I mean, he was whipped. He was hung on a cross. He definitely knows what pain is. And it is some sort of comfort to when you're in pain, go, okay, he knows it. He's, he gets me, he gets where I'm at right now. And, you know, just tell him, thank you. And I think that's a hard thing too, to say thank you in your pain, but it is, There's especially, really you know, you, you'd mentioned physical pain, but I think what you're addressing really is the emotional pain. Yeah, absolutely. That emotional we all experience. Pain and, yes. and, and we do, it's just part of this life. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something that God allows in our lives. But if, if we recognize it as that, then, then mm -hmm. we, we can grow from it. Doesn't mean I enjoy it, no. but, but I can sit there and say, well, the Lord's up to something. And, yeah. uh, and, and take it from there so so just kind of recap i'm kind of making myself a list to review so uh, so far what he's what what god's doing for me what jesus is doing for me uh, is that he's not he's not requiring of me something he doesn't do himself he doesn't have a double standard for me uh, he's revealing himself to me he actually act, reveals himself to me he sympathizes with my weaknesses. Um, he knows what it's like to be me. Uh, he uh, he's comes to my aid. He's, he's there to help me. He's, he's there to help me find a way out of temptations. Uh, 
he's not going to reject me. So he's so the opposite of that would be he's going to accept me. He accepts me. That's right. Oh my gosh, I love that. Uh, he, he empathizes with me and knows how I feel. Uh, you know, those are all things because when you brought this up, I was thinking, well, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm kind of like with those people that raise their hands. I know what to do, but I, what's he doing is like, I kind of puzzled me actually. So it's kind of, it's refreshing to hear these things because I was saying to myself, man, I, I don't actually live that way where I'm thinking and connecting with him on that kind of level. Well, and you know, based on all the things that you just summarized, I can draw near to him with confidence. Mm. I can be confident before him. And it's well, a, that, it's that a, would be something I, that would be something I could do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ready for another one? Yo, yeah. do you have any thoughts or comments on any of that? No, I, I was just thinking, yeah, the, the rub is the rub in all of this is you, you go to church, you hear other religious people and they, they tell you that doesn't work, you know, and I think that's the rub you have constantly going on in your brain when you're stuck in sin or stuck in pain or whatever's going on is you think God is turning your his back on you because we've heard that from other Christian leaders. And I think that's the, I think that's the rub of talking against that and saying, wait a minute, no, I don't want that. <laughs> yeah. I know God is there. I know God accepts me. And you got to challenge those things in your brain. That's exactly right. And, and you know, it's what it comes down to is really what they're saying is that obedience equals acceptance. Absolutely. And obedience doesn't equal acceptance. The yeah. only way I'm accepted is through the blood of Jesus. Yes. And, but as a result of that, I want to be obedient. And mm -hmm. so not because I'm accepted, because I already am accepted, but because I love him and he loves me. Mm -hmm. And the difference is as wide as the world. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. All right. What's your third part? Another one. Another thing he's done for me is that he gives us everything that we need. And so what, what do you mean everything? And, you know, Second Peter in chapter one, he lays it out, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him, and that's key, who called us by his own glory and excellence, for by these, which is his own glory and excellence, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. And this is the amazing thing right here, so that by them, you may become partakers of the divine nature. He's given me everything that I need. So again, you know, what does that mean? So we have this true knowledge of him. And because we have a relationship with Jesus, we have in us everything we need. And, you know, this is another thing that the enemy doesn't want us to know. He doesn't want us to know that we have everything we need in this life uh, for, for godliness. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's through Jesus. It's not through a theology. It's not through a doctrine. It's not through a method. It's through Jesus. And that's it. Through the true knowledge of him. And so, you know, I, I like... I'm a visual kind of a person. I like to think of things. And so I'm, a, I'm really a plant man by training, although I didn't really do anything with it in my life. I had a degree in botany. But I do like to do things with plants and I, I'm kind of a bones eye hack. You know, I try to do bones eye trees and different things and it's fun. I'm not very good at it, but it's a lot of fun and, you know, the garden, you know, but I am fascinated by plants. And so we have a park close by that has some nice oak trees. And in a good year, I've gone over there and collected acorns. And, you know, I've got as many as 30 of, 30 of them or so. And, you know, I thought to myself, I, you know, I want to see if I can grow an oak tree uh, from, these, from these acorns. Hmm. And so what you do first is you put them in water. And, and if anything floats, you throw those away because they're, they're not right. You know, either an insect's hollow them out or something, or they just won't germinate. So they're no good. So you get rid of those. And the rest, you know, I'll wrap in a paper towel moist paper towel and I'll put them in a plastic bag and with permission from my wife I'll put them in the refrigerator 
And you may think, well, what's the big deal with that? Well, you need to put them in the refrigerator for six months, you know, because I, if I get them in the spring or, or in the fall when, when the acorns come out, I actually need to germinate it in the spring. So it needs to sit in the refrigerator for six months. And so <laughs> it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. And so spring comes along and I take out the bag and I put it on a countertop against the wall, make sure the paper towel's moist, no direct sun. And in a few weeks, you can see the acorn starting to sprout. It starts to sprout the embryonic leaves as well as the embryonic root. And from there, it starts to grow. And so once they've grown a little, I take them out and I put them in a seed starter with soil and they continue to grow. And it's a very cool process to watch. And, and, and some people would be bored by that, but for me, it's really cool. And that acorn or that oak seed has everything it needs to become an oak. So think of that, it's an oak. It's not mature. Mm. It may not even look like a tree, but it is 100% oak. Now, if you go to the park and you look at the 60 foot mother tree, it looks very different, but in its essence, it isn't any different. It's an oak, an oak is an oak is an oak. And so what is interesting about that is that Inside that acorn, God in his wisdom, you know, made seeds, which is essentially what that is, have everything that they need to become an oak. Now, if, if I left those acorns out and didn't plant them, they'd eventually die, right? Because it only has so much energy to be able to live in what's called the hypercotyledon. It, it, <clears throat> it can only go so far. And so it does need to be planted and it does need to be watered. But to me, the, the most interesting thing about plants is that they produce their own food. And I think most people don't really realize that. They think, well, they get food from the soil and, and that's absolutely not true. No matter how many companies called fertilizer plant food, it's not plant food. Fertilizer are key elements that are necessary for the chemical processes required for the plant to produce its own food and, and other essential processes. But the critical thing for growth is food production. So where does, where does, if it's not in the soil, where does the plant get its food? Well, it gets food through a process called photosynthesis. And that's the only way it gets food. And it's, and it's interesting, you can take the carbon, you can take the oxygen, you can take the hydrogen and put them all together, but unless it has light, food production won't occur. It won't produce sugar. And that's where the plant gets its food. So God made it so that a plant doesn't produce its own food without light. And I'm convinced this is one of the many lessons he teaches through his creations. And so for us, who's the light? Well, it's Jesus. And when we're born again, he puts within us a seed that contains everything we need and we become his children. And when we become Christians, he gives us everything we need for life and godliness. And as we go through this life, we receive his light and the growth process begins and we start to produce spiritual food. We rest at night, just like a plant does. And when daylight comes, we absorb his light throughout the day and our spirit grows with his spirit. So that's another creation lesson. When we see the sun, we can think of our light. We can think of Jesus and through our spiritual photosynthesis process, as we focus on the light, we produce spiritual food. And most of that food really is for others. And as that food is produced for others, it refreshes us and gives us life. And the interesting thing is that the light really shows that we can't do it except with the light and we can't do it without him. Mm -hmm. And the other encouraging thing is that it is a process. It's a process of growing in our relationship with him. And so uh, basically, that's the way I look at this, this concept that he's given me everything that I need. And 
you know, according to my concept of God, if he, if he gives me everything I need, then, you know, basically he loves me. And I, regardless of my circumstances, regardless of where I am in my life, I can believe that I have what I need in Jesus Christ. Yeah, I like that. And I like that uh, every time you're done or even in the middle of these talks is you're, you always land back on relationship. That's foundational. Yeah, exactly. I, I love the, I love the relationship part of him. I love the, where he's always there with me and I can talk to him anywhere. So I, I'm really enjoying every time you're talking, you're just going right back to relationship. I love talking about that. Yeah, me too. No, it's just, it's, it's so important because, you know, Steve mentioned, we went to that one program that basically cemented us as legalists. And I don't know if you remember, Steve, but you know, the, one of the instructors, uh, many people had been through the program before us. And, and it was interesting to me that uh, we would always pray for past uh, students. And just about every time we would pray for them, <clears throat> you know, it was always like, well, Joe, you know, he's, he's not doing what he should be doing. And well, it was always this negative, negative stuff. We wasn't performing, basically. Yeah. And, you know, I used to sit there and think, gee, you know, I wonder what they're going to pray about me, you know, when I'm out of here. And, and, you know, <laughs> there's no way, there was no way to make them happy. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, yeah, one of the, I remember one of the th things that, uh, we prayed for ourselves uh, so we wouldn't become one of those guys that got prayed for. It was like, oh, Lord, <laughs> the, word, the, phrase, the phrase we used was tubing out. Like, oh, Lord, keep me from tubing out. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so, but it's, it's refreshing to know that he's giving me everything I need because he loves me. And it's because of who he is and that seed that he planted through the spirit in me has everything it needs to become a mature believer in him. And as we walk through our life and know what he's doing for us, we can be encouraged and come to him with confidence and with joy that, and know that he's for me. And, and, and I really agree with you, Noah, that the whole relationship aspect and is is foundational because that's what gives life mm -hmm. and it uh it's not doing things it's not what you do it's who you know <laughs> and who we know is jesus and, and that's who we want to know and because in him is life so steve hahn I, I had a question how long did it take you to get out of legalism did oh, it that's a that's a great question noah it took decades Decades, yeah. For me, it took yeah. decades. And because, you know, the bottom line is, is that you get to a point where, I mean, I was doing something every night, every single day and night, essentially, for the Lord, some kind of a program, visitation, mm -hmm. one on ones, getting ready to preach, just doing all different kinds of stuff and waking up in the morning. And wishing that I had died at night. Yeah. Because nothing made me happy. Nothing fulfilled me. And I knew something was wrong. Yeah. And basically, you know, you, I, I just dropped all of that stuff and just said, Lord, I, if this is what the Christian life is, I don't want any part of it. Yeah. And, you know, I can, I can look back now and just, and just think the Lord is, is going like, finally. Yeah, now, you know, now maybe you can look at me yeah. instead of all these things that you think are making me happy and really aren't. Yeah, and really he just wanted you to say hi. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> just look to me. And so yeah. it took a while because you know every neuron in my brain is saying what I have to do because that's all I heard in my Christian life is what mm -hmm. I have to do for Jesus. And not what he's doing for me. Yeah, and I was that that was my next question. You pretty much answered it. I was wondering if it brought you to suicide or brought you to a point of wanting to die, but it sounded like yes, totally. it did. Yes. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, there was no fulfillment in life. Yeah, so there's no life in it. There is no life in it at all. Yeah. Well, that's great. So. Yeah, thanks for asking those questions. Oh, I think that was great. And, and that kind of reiterates what Steve said, that it's a process. Yeah, uh, and it is a process. And so, you know, the, the mornings when you wake up and wish you had died the night before, mm, were you any less of an oak uh, ha at that moment uh, than before or since? And, and that's a great thought, Steve, because you're completely an oak. Mm -hmm. And... I, you know, I, I have to say, I even got to a point where it was like, God, I am done with you. I yeah. am so done with you. I, I just can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm finished. If this is what the Christian life is about, then I don't want any part of it. And, uh, and slowly and surely, you know, he just keeps speaking to your heart. And deep inside, it's like, I'm, I'm glad that you're seeing that doing these things isn't the way to me, but the way to me is by faith and in, 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 in a relationship. And, mm -hmm. and so even as hard as I wanted to just give it up, I still couldn't, I couldn't do it. Cause I knew that the, there is a God and that he loves me in spite of how I felt. And so it took a long time though. It did. Well, yeah. that would be something else that I'd throw in of what he does for me, not what I do for him. And that's he pursues me. He does. He, he pursues, pursues me. me. Yeah, absolutely. Even if I quit, even if I go, I'm done with this. I like, I am not, I am not following you. What, yeah. I'm, what I'm really saying is I'm chucking this concept of God I have because it doesn't work. Exactly. You know, it's, a really, it's not that I'm really getting rid of him, but I've come to the point where, you know, it's like, I don't believe in this God. And it's and like you said, it's all like finally I'm not like that. And yeah. so I, I I say I'm you know I'm not believing or I'm maybe even an atheist. And I think uh, I think that there's times is like great stop believing in that false god. You know it's like you should be an atheist. You should come come to the real thing and and you know turn to the light uh, instead of you know you're looking at this little flashlight thing that I'm holding. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look up at the sunshine and create your own energy you know make you have some food you know make some food that's uh, right so, well i that, think that's a great that's a great point steve is that what you're chucking isn't god you're chucking that incorrect concept of god because mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. you still want him yeah you still want him and he's pers and he wants you and you can't like you can't escape i've tried running away from him he follows me everywhere i go <laughs> that's right <laughs> It's like I'm true with you. And That's right. Yeah. I can't get away. I can't get away. If I go to the bottom of the ocean, he's there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so can I throw out like this is a little bit controversial? But your botany, uh, we a couple weeks ago or last, yeah, we had our biting conversations, and Chad shared on the the vine and the branches, and it was like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. And he showed this beautiful picture of the vine and the branches, and. And the, and, the, and, the, and the vine says to the branch, Jesus says to the branch, this will probably get me in trouble, but that's okay. Uh, the, the vine says to the branch, without me, you can do nothing. So as a, as a botanist, if you cut those branches off, uh, what would happen to the vine? Well, and that's an interesting question because it depends on how much energy is stored in the vine, just from a botanical perspective. Yeah. Usually what they're going to do is it's going to grow more branches. Mm -hmm. you know, it'll send out, mm -hmm. based on the uh, mare stems on the branch, it'll send out a, you know, a, a new branch. Or, or excuse me, the mare stems on the vine, it'll send out a new branch. And, and, uh, but, the vine, but the vine really couldn't ever do without branches. It needs the branch because the branch has the leaves. And it's the leaves that absorb the light and where the food production occurs that goes down to the plant and to the roots and so that's where the energy comes from is from that that process of absorbing a light and making that chemical change from those compounds into sugar which is energy so in the, so in the relationship then the, the vine says to the branches jesus says to steve steve reinhard um, without me you can do nothing and i say uh, back to the, the the vine. I'm the branch. I say back to the vine. Right, right on, Lord. Without you, I can do nothing. And as a side note, 
without me, you can do nothing. Yeah. <laughs> In a way, that's true. Yeah. I mean, if you so he's chosen to if you really want to literally think of it that way in terms of, you know, but it's the Lord that's created that process and created it in that manner. Yeah, and it's such an intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. when, you, when I look at it that way, it's an intimate relationship because it's not me versus him or me in a, what, you know, the, the goofy word would be, um, oh, what's that word that, uh, what do they call what, uh, Basically a one-sided relationship. Oh, okay. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I can't remember the word, but it's some, some word we don't like. Oh, uh, oh my gosh, I just had it. There's a book about it. <laughs> that, there's a book that's a comic book because it's such a spoofy, dumb word. Uh, codependent. It's not a codependent yeah. relationship. It's a very, really completely codependent. We need each other. Mm -hmm. uh, I need the Lord and he... For some re strange reason, the way he set the process up, uh, he made me a part of him, a part of his body, a part of his vine, a part of, and uh, and it's a it's a beautiful. It is a beautiful thing, and and you know the way I think of that, Steve, is oneness. We're mm -hmm. one, and yeah. and as as we become one, you know, growth occurs, and it's it's a beautiful thing. So, so Noah, are you watching our time? Because I kind of spaced it out. I think we're, yeah, we're maybe going over. I mean, it's all good stuff. I mean, and I just wanted to add, like, yeah, when, I mean, for me, this is recently that's been really changing me is when I realized he's in me and I am him, just like you're saying, Steve Hahn, is we are one. And like Steve Reinhardt, you know, it's true. He needs us as much as we need him. And I, you know, like going out to go preach or go out to go talk to somebody, I need to go be there so then he can talk through me. Yeah. So he needs us just as much as we need him. I always tell him, Hey, I'm going to go, I'm going to show up at this time. You too. I need you to show up as well. <laughs> Cause I don't want people to just hear from Noah, but I need you there too. And he does. He shows up every time. He does show up. And you, and you know the, and, and you guys may disagree with this. This is, you know, we're talking about God needing us. Well, you know, he's, God is completely self-sufficient. And he always has been self-sufficient and is self-sufficient. He was, he was quite content in his, in his oneness with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the, the, you know, the, the Trinity. They're all not needing anything. But the way I think of that is that he created us because he wants us. Mm -hmm. He didn't need us, but he wants us. Mm -hmm. and he does want us. Yeah. And, and that's why we're his children. And that's why it's all about a relationship mm -hmm. because he wants us. And just that thought in itself is very encouraging because, because, you know, not only do does he want me, but I want him. Yeah. And you know, it's that it's that uh, husband wife uh, groom bride relationship of wanting each other, and it's a beautiful picture. Yeah, and I thought for years that he's, you know, he's selfish too because he wants me. He wants me fully. He doesn't want me to go off here and look check out all this stuff or get all the other my other needs it met. He wants me to go to him. He does. He and he makes that very clear time and time again. Amen. Well, I think it's, it is probably, you know, been an hour or so. And so, you know, there's, there's other points, uh, obviously out there, other things that Jesus well, is doing we for might us. Have to, we might have to do uh, part two. Yeah. 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 This has been really great. And I think the idea that we could end on that a really high note of that he wants, he wants us and I want him. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure it gets better than that and that we're one with him. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I love that. And, you know, I, I guess I've never really sat and thought about, I definitely have thought what I can do for him, but yeah, I guess I've never really sat there and thought, 
you know, what's he doing for me? And when you said that, the only thing that came to my mind is he's teaching me. And yeah, he's just constantly teaching me all the time. All my little bad decisions, he's still teaching me through all of that stuff, which is cool because he's a living God. He's with us. Yeah, it's it's a, I don't know. You give me a lot to think about it. So thank you, Steve. Yeah, thank, thank you, you guys. Steve Reinhardt. It's fun yeah. to share and just get everybody else's thoughts on this. Yeah, my, my other one thing that I know that he does for me, this, this was the first thing that popped into mind, was he speaks Steve. Yes. You know, yeah. <laughs> I don't have to learn a new language. I didn't have to memorize yeah. any verses before he spoke to me. Mm -hmm. He speaks to me and he meets me where I'm at. And I so appreciate and love love that he does that, that he's doing yeah. that. That he that he, you know, I don't have to be a Bible scholar or anything other than me. He just speaks Steve. And mm -hmm. I am you know, I'm profoundly grateful uh, that he does. Yeah, that's that's interesting. That kind of relates to another one of the things uh, that we were going to share and maybe can share in part two is that, you know, he gives us wisdom and it, it has to do with what you were saying, Steve, but we won't go into that now. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys for sharing your heart, sharing what's going on in your life. And uh, thank you for the listeners. And we will do another one very soon. All right. Thanks, guys. Love you guys. Bye.